All right, welcome back everyone. This week we're going to be getting into igneous rocks. This is a two-part lecture, so in the first part we're going to go over what an igneous rock is, what is a, where does that fit into the rock cycle, and a little bit of how uh, an igneous rock comes to be. In the second, we're going to get into volcanism. So recently we got into what uh, a mineral is and how we define a mineral and there is a very specific list of properties and criteria that a mineral has to meet in order to be a mineral otherwise it's not it might be a mineraloid at that point or not even a mineraloid but to be a mineral it has to meet all of those criteria with a rock we have uh, a much more widely encompassing definition so a, a rock can be any naturally occurring solid mass or aggregate of minerals and or mineraloids so anything that is non-living and made out of earth material. This can include anthropogenic materials, so anything produced by human processes or industrial processes. One example would be slag. That is a byproduct of uh, iron smelting. Yes, you can get slag from a lot of industrial processes, but slag is a rock. Um, glass is also a rock, so volcanic glass or anything biological as long as it's dead. So a lot of dead bacteria, uh, dead plants, things like that, that gets worked into rocks or at least the remnants of it. Sometimes they'll be replaced by different minerals as well. So we categorize these broadly by three main categories and this is primarily based on composition but also surrounding a couple of other features. So composition and the way it came to be. Number one, igneous, and that's the one we're starting with, are all rocks that have a volcanic or magmatic origin. Secondly, metamorphic, anything that has been altered by heat and pressure enough to change its atomic structuring. And sedimentary, anything that has was once sediment that has since been compacted and or cemented. So it's been... It was once loose sediment that is now solidified into a rock. So why should we care about rocks in the first place? Well, if not for just the sheer purpose of increasing our knowledge of the world around us, having a greater knowledge of rocks and minerals allows us to better utilize the resources around us. In consideration of construction, having a good knowledge of the materials that we're working with can allow us to build uh, buildings that have a higher tolerance for the environment and defend us against natural hazards. Uh, one example of this is that most of the housing in the United States uh, is not built to last. It is more so built to meet demand. So it's uh, for economic profit rather than longevity, which is why we tend to have a lot of problems. Most houses are built with wood, however, um, the cons of building with wood is that there are high maintenance costs, it's vulnerable to fire, and it's not a very good sound barrier. However, it is less expensive, it's lighter and easier to transport, um, and it is biodegradable, but two out of three of those reasons are purely economical. Uh, one other common example is that most all roofs in the U.S. have uh, shingles that are made of, for the most part, asphalt. And asphalt is good for serving its, its main purpose, which is to repel or deflect water, which is the idea in having uh, an asphalt roof made of those shingles and having an asphalt driveway. However, the average lifespan of an asphalt shingle roof is only about 20 years. Uh, in many parts of Europe, they use clay shingles, as you can see in the bottom right corner here. Um, these are tiles that overlap with one another, and these will last more in the ballpark of 100 years or so. Now, the, the trade-off is that they are more expensive and they are heavier, so it does cost more to transport them as well. So it's really uh, an economic sacrifice of short-term gain. Furthermore, having an in-depth knowledge about uh, what rocks are, house what resources allow us to be able to better access those on the first try and to be able to extract them with minimal uh, complication or destruction and or harm to the surrounding environment. One prime example in this is the extraction of natural gas and or oil. Um, 
These are usually housed within marine type bedrocks, so limestone is a common constituent, where uh, a lot of the times we can use seismic data to get an idea of what's underground, but it's not always a perfect picture, and sometimes we can spend uh, upwards of millions of dollars drilling a hole to, uh, to a location where we think there is oil, come to find out it's not oil at all, but something with a similar density, like a salt dome or something like that. So um, I had a friend who worked for ExxonMobil, that exact thing happened to them. Their boss was not happy that they drilled a $2.3 million oil well, only to find that there was no oil. Having a better knowledge of rocks in general can also help us understand what's happened in the past and what's happened in the future. We have a general assumption in geology that the processes by which we see create a particular type of rock today uh, are the same processes that would create that rock, say, a million years ago or a billion years ago. And one example of where we can use past rocks to predict future conditions is with uh, within climate research. We can look at um, the amount of living organisms that thrive under certain temperature and acidity conditions within uh, limestone. So these would be dead organisms within limestones. We're able to test for that content and use that as a proxy data for the acidity and temperature conditions of the earth at that time when we can also use carbon dating or radiometric dating to verify the age so we can know what the climate looked like at that time. We can do that with several different types of bedrock or a whole series of bedrock to be able to build a storyline about what the climate has looked like over the last several million years. Um, we can also get direct rather than proxy data uh, from ice cores. So we can drill ice cores out of the Arctic ice and uh, within that ice are trapped little gas bubbles, which you can see a picture of there. Those we can test directly for gas content and compare that to the, co the different gas contents that we are seeing in our atmosphere today. So you all have seen a number of cycles in your previous science classes. Probably the first one that comes to mind is the water cycle, precipitation, uh, condensation, evaporation, and so on. We use a similar idea here in geology within the rock cycle. Um, so you'll see in this image that we have those three main groups of rocks that we talked about. Igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, and sedimentary rocks. And within this we have the processes that take us from one rock type to another. So if we start here at igneous rocks, uh, remember that igneous rocks are a product of magma. So if magma cools, we get an igneous rock, or if lava cools, we get an igneous rock. If we break down in that rock into tiny enough pieces through weathering and erosion, eventually it will be a sediment. And then if we have some groundwater flow through that sediment and there's more sediment light on top of it, it's weighing it down, it's compacting it, um, and it ends up cementing together over time, we end up with a sedimentary rock. Now it doesn't necessarily need to end there. A sedimentary rock can then over time be exposed to heat and pressure, say that more sediment keeps dumping on top of it, it gets deeper and deeper, so that added heat and pressure can metamorphose that sedimentary rock into a metamorphic rock by altering the composition and or the atomic structure of that rock itself. From there, a metamorphic rock may be melted down even further if it gets to an increasing, further increasing depth into magma and the cycle starts back over again. This is not, however, a set schedule. It does not happen directly in this order, which is exactly why we have multiple arrows going in multiple directions. We can go from igneous to magma directly by melting. We can go from igneous to metamorphic by that increasing in depth and being exposed to heat and pressure. We can go from metamorphic to sediment by breaking down those rocks into smaller and smaller pieces until it qualifies as sediment, and so on and so forth. So there are a couple of different ways to look at this and a couple of different ways we can move about the rock cycle, which is why I like to use this diagram. In addition to that, it I think that this removes the whole cycle element and kind of puts it into a flow chart more so. So here you can see just another perspective of the rock cycle. 
I think that this does a good job of highlighting the primary mechanisms by which rocks can change as well. As you see, the options here are heat and pressure, melting, cooling, and weathering and erosion, and compacting and cementing. So we really only have about five options for how rocks can become different types of rocks. So what if we put this into more of a realistic sense? So same idea here, just presented in a slightly different format. We could start with magma and any rock that results from magma, whether it's coming all the way out of, say, a volcano, or it's just solidifying at a lower depth because there are lower temperatures, is going to be an igneous rock. So we have two options for igneous rock. From there, say if that igneous rock was uplifted and exposed and melting of glaciers and rain and wind break it down into sediment, it may be dumped into an ocean or it will naturally follow the flow of gravity and water into a basin of some sort or a low-lying point in the land. And over time, that sediment will build up into layers and as more and more layers get built up, there will be more and more weight or pressure of the overlying sediment, which will compact and cement that sediment into sedimentary rocks. Then at some point with enough heat and pressure, those sedimentary rocks can be metamorphosed or changed into metamorphic rocks. And then if they continue to increase in heat and, in heat and pressure, they may melt and return back to the beginning where we were with magma. Now you can start at any which point. We could start uh, here at weathering erosion. We could start at sediment. We could start at metamorphic. Doesn't matter. We could go backwards. Metamorphic, if it were uplifted, we could have these metamorphic rocks directly uplifted and then those weathered and eroded back to sediment. We could have sedimentary rocks directly uplifted and then weathered and eroded back into sediment or any which way we can go about this. But on whole, based on the characterization of how the rocks came to be, there are three categories to consider. Igneous rocks that are volcanic in origin, metamorphic rocks, rocks that have been changed by heat and pressure, and sedimentary rocks, any rocks that were once sediment. For the rest of this lecture, we will focus our attention specifically on igneous rocks. Igneous rocks are categorized or described in general by their color slash composition. We went over this a little bit when we talked about minerals. So um, those rocks or minerals having lighter elements like silica and oxygen will also be lighter in coloration. We call those felsic rocks. This would be an example of a felsic rock, felsic igneous rock. Uh, granite and rhyolite are two other examples of that. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have mafic rocks, so those will be the ones that are darker in coloration and also contain heavier elements like magnesium and iron. And then, of course, in the middle, we have those which are intermediate, diorite and andesite are an example of these, and those are going to be your medium gray tones. These intermediate rocks will, will generally still have a higher uh, content of the lighter elements like silica and oxygen, calcium, potassium, aluminum, um, but will have a lesser content of that compared to the felsic rocks. So intermediate is going to be something around the 50% mark uh, for the lighter elemental composition, and felsic is going to be something greater than 70% lighter elemental composition. Having referred to magma a couple of times already, it's important to distinguish between magma and lava. And when we're talking about the difference between these two, it's a simple question of in or out. Lava is any molten rock that is on the surface of the earth, whereas magma is any molten rock that is below the surface of the earth. So the minute that magma exits the subsurface and is onto the surface of the land, it becomes lava. And when we talk about igneous rocks, for the most part, we're talking about rocks that have resulted from magmatic production, meaning that they solidified from magma that reached a level of the subsurface where temperatures and pressures were low enough for it to crystallize and solidify or cool.
However, we know that volcanoes erupt, so in any case where we have a volcanic eruption of any sort, we're going to be talking about lava, and we're going to be talking about a different subclassification of igneous rocks. And we went through Earth's interior recently. While we do get igneous rocks that are directly from the asthenosphere and the mantle below the lithosphere uh, that are ejecting, we, for the most part, all of our igneous rocks are actually recycled crust. So recall that plate tectonics are the interaction between tectonic plates or chunks of crust. And when these interact, if we have one that uh, collides with one plate that collides with another plate and there's a difference in their densities, the one with the higher density will subduct or go underneath the one with a lighter density. And eventually that subducting plate will be pulled to a depth where it will begin to melt. And once it melts, much like a lava lamp, that change from solid to liquid will change its density and the liquid, the hot liquid, will rise. Heat rises. Which is where we get most of the magma that we have within the crust. And because this is recycled crust, Generally, that magma will have a granitic composition when we are seeing it within a continental plate. When we are looking at oceanic crust, that's generally where we get our new or uh, fresh crust uh, in general. So that is where we have uh, a direct line more so between the mantle or the asthenosphere to the crust. Anytime that we're considering magma or lava volcanic activity within a continent, it is generally going to be from magmatic formation within the crust or that recycling of crustal material. So you might be wondering, well, at what point do these subducting plates or any rocks that are pushed downward end up actually melting, metamorphosing and then melting? And uh, when we define this temperature and pressure, we're talking about a geothermal gradient. And geothermal gradients can exist in, in any medium where the temperature is changing with a change in depth. So if any of you have uh, either done deep diving or deep snorkeling, more so scuba diving, uh, you were taught about the geotherm, which is what they call the point where you go from warm water to very cold water. That is a point when you are increasing in depth as you're diving down into the ocean where you will feel a very dramatic temperature change of about 10 degrees, as well as a pressure change on your body. We have the same thing with rocks as well. We take a gander here at our geothermal gradient. Um, we have P for temperature, this is in degrees Celsius, on our x-axis, and PZ, which is representative of depth, on our y-axis. So as we increase in depth, we are also increasing in temperature. And while different rocks have different temperatures that they melt at, generally we start to see solid rock begin to melt somewhere around 1300 to 1400 degrees Celsius. Now this isn't necessarily an instantaneous effect. It will start to melt sort of like um, a slushy that you're drinking while outside on a hot day. It's not all gonna instantly liquefy at once as soon as you step out of the gas station and into the sun. It's gonna slowly melt over time. Um, and the same thing happens in this case with, with solid rock. But as soon as any part of it does liquefy, it will begin to separate out from the part that is still solid or partially solid and ascend towards cooler temperatures. Now, one other thing that we need to take notice of is that this geothermal gradient is not a linear trend, meaning it's not a direct straight line uh, across our graph. If it were a straight line, that would mean that as we increase in depth, and we would equal, equally or proportionally increase in temperature, and that the melting would be equivalent in speed or rate all the way across. So let's go back to our slushy example to make this a little bit simpler. If 
we are stepping out of the gas station, fresh slushy in hand, and it is 70 degrees outside, say we're in this sort of territory for temperature. We're up here in the cooler zone. It's going to take a lot longer for that slushy to start to melt than if it is we're, say, we are on vacation in Thailand and we just stepped out of the 7-Eleven with our fresh slushy and it is 105 degrees Fahrenheit. We're up here on the higher end of temperature. It's going to melt much quicker than if we are back home in Michigan at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So this curve really only means that we are increasing in the rate of melting as we increase in temperature. And as stated earlier, different rocks will melt at different temperatures. And it goes a step further than that, that different minerals will also melt at different temperatures due to differences in strength based on what kind of bonding they have or the type of structuring, um, if it, how many planes of weakness it has, so on and so forth. There are a lot of variables that contribute to the temperature at which a mineral will melt. But keep in mind that rocks contain different minerals, so what we end up having is that the individual minerals or components of a rock will melt out at different times. This means that as those different components start to melt out, we're left with different things or different compositions than what we originally started with. Again, because as melting progresses and the different components liquidize at the different temperatures or the different minerals will liquidize or melt at different temperatures, they will begin to ascend towards the surface and head for cooler temperatures. And with the exception of a few special minerals, the, those containing lighter elements, so silica, um, oxygen, aluminum, potassium, all those we went through for the felsic rocks earlier will melt out before those that are more dense, such as magnesium and iron. We've talked about how temperature and pressure are the main functions by which a rock will melt and turn to magma. To build on that, we can also have decompression melting, which occurs uh, in passive response to lithospheric stretching and thinning as plates are pulled apart. So this means that at a divergent plate boundary, or in other words, we have one plate here on the left and another plate here on the right, and they are diverging or spreading apart from one another. As they do that, this connection between them will thin out and which means that we have less overlying weight and therefore less pressure on this channel of magma or this magma chamber sitting below it. So even though this is at a lower depth and lower temperature, this change in pressure can result in melting, specifically called decompression melting because we are decompressing that magmatic chamber. We can think of this situation almost as a reversed pressure cooker. So a pressure cooker or uh, an Instapot works by pressurizing your food within that pot. And when we add pressure to a substance, such as maybe soup in this case, those molecules will be much closer together. And when they're closer together, that means the distance between them or the distance that they have to transfer energy, specifically in this case for cooking your food, heat, heat energy is shorter, which means that it can then cook faster because there's less traveling distance between those molecules. Which then means that you can cook your chicken chili or whatever it might be in a relatively short period of time. Now, with consideration of our uh, soft, solid mantle rock that is staying at the same temperature that it's been in depth but now has less overlying pressure, we have molecules that were tightly packed because it's a soft solid. They're relatively close to each other with a certain amount of heat energy within that material because it's been at a, a, a depth with a higher temperature that is now experiencing a relatively rapid decrease in pressure, which means that that energy now has more room to go and it can expand 
which will escape smaller spaces, pushing apart these molecules as it rises up and changing our solid, soft solid material into a liquid because those molecules are now further apart. So in the case of our Instapot, we are decreasing our cook time and by decreasing the boiling point of our liquid or our soup or our chicken chili, whatever it may be, by increasing the pressure and therefore pushing those molecules together so there's shorter travel distance for that heat energy. Again, decreasing the boiling point by increasing the pressure. Adjacently, in the case of decompression melting, we are decreasing the pressure but maintaining the temperature, so there has to be an, ex uh, an expansion of that energy. That's why you're not supposed to open the Instapot or the pressure cooker while it's still cooking, because it will explode. Another case uh, of magmatism is where we have an isolated spot or channel of magma coming up from the asthenosphere or underlying mantle. Mind you that the tectonic plates of the lithosphere are moving over the asthenosphere. Uh, the asthenosphere is not changing in position, but the plates are. This is what we call a plume, and Hawaii is a result of a plume, also referred to as a hot spot. This is why we have the Hawaiian Islands in an arc-like shape. We call this a, a volcanic island arc. And this represents the progression or direction of the plate movement over the asthenosphere because that hole or that channel of magma is not moving, but rather the plate overlying that spot is. So we have our oldest plates here and then our young, or sorry, our oldest islands over here and our youngest islands over here, which means that our hot spot is currently under our youngest island right here, and the plate has moved in this direction as well over time. So that would be in the northwest direction. So it would, so if the hot spot stays here, that means that when this island was previously over here, it has since moved in the northwest direction. The Japanese islands would be another example of a volcanic island arc as well. Flux melting is yet another uh, mechanism of melting where specifically the temperature at which the rock will melt is lowered by the presence of water. And this is simply because water is a better conductor of electricity uh, or heat than air is. Um, this is why you don't want to be in a pool when there is a thunder and lightning storm. Ideally, you don't want to be out in the exposed uh, air, air anyways because the air is going to have a higher humidity or water content during a thunder and lightning storm anyways, but if you have to choose between being in uh, in a pool outside or outside not in the pool, you don't want to be in the pool and that's because water is a better conductor of heat and electricity. Same idea if we put two sugar cubes identical on a hot plate and we uh, make one of them wet and leave one of them dry, the wet one will melt faster and that's because water is a better conductor than air. So all of the water that's occupying that pore space or those voids within the sugar cube will conduct that heat energy between all of those different particles a lot quicker than the air that is occupying the void space in the dry cube will. So for the rocks, how does the water get there? Well, it's simple. There's going to be water incorporated anytime that there's water sitting on top of that rock or that sediment. So if we have subducting oceanic lithosphere, that's going to have some water content, which means that it will start melting out at a lower temperature than that of its dry counterpart, the continental crust. And again, we call this flux melting. So this is a good time to, to take a little brain break and pause the video and get up and move around.
And I include these specific points for brain breaks in my lectures because uh, it's been shown by numerous studies that we actually retain information and learn better when there are multiple breaks. And if this were an in-person class, I would be stopping and doing activities with you guys and exercises, um, not necessarily physical, but uh, something that relates to the course material. I wouldn't be lecturing at you for more than 10 to 15 minutes at a time, so I hope that you guys do pause the video here and just get up and get a little bit of movement um, or just think about something else for a minute and then come right back into it. So as a review, we can get magmatic bodies a few different ways. Uh, we can also call this magmatic genesis or where the magma is coming from, so we can have it directly from the asthenosphere or the underlying mantle. We can also get it directly from a plume or hotspot that's more of a, a straight narrow channel to the mantle or a subduction of a plate and then ladder melting of that plate once it reaches certain depths. As mentioned earlier, different rocks or different minerals will melt out at different temperatures. And this works backwards as well. Uh, so when we are having cooling temperatures, different rocks or different minerals will crystallize out of a liquid magma at different temperatures. This is what we call fractional crystallization, meaning that only certain fractions of a magma will solidify depending on what temperature you're at. And we have Bowen's reaction series, which is a representation of some of the common minerals that we have within ultramafic, mafic, intermediate, and felsic magmas or rocks, um, and their relative temperatures at which they will solidify or melt. So from here we have high temperatures to low temperatures and ultramafic to felsic. So minerals such as olivine and pyroxene will be the first to crystallize or solidify at the highest temperatures and as we continue to cool we will start to get more amphiboles, mycobiotites, and at our coolest temperatures we'll get muscovite micas and quartz. And when we're increasing in temperature, we call this fractional melting. With this knowledge, we can take any rock and break it down into its bare mineral components, and depending on the relative percentages of those components or the different amounts of minerals, we can use Bowen's reaction series to sort of uh, back calculate at what temperature uh, this about what temperature or a specific temperature range at which uh, the particular rock sample that we're looking at would have solidified at. So fractionation is uh, encompasses both fractional melting and fractional crystallization. Fraction, fractionation is simply the separation of materials depending on what has melted and what has solidified at any given point uh, in certain depth or pressure and temperature conditions. So one example that we can use with this is a uh, the melting of a sundae. So if we look at all of these components, say the hot fudge will melt at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the ice cream at 32 degrees, whipped, at, whipped cream at 60, so on and so forth. So what order, if we're increasing in temperature from room temp, 20, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, is already starting to melt. And if we keep increasing that to say eventually we throw this in the, uh, the incinerator, what will melt out in what order? So first we'll have the ice cream at the lowest temperature, 32 degrees. Then we'll have the whipped cream start to melt at 60 degrees. And we haven't done anything besides sit down and start to eat at this point. And then maybe we've moved outside and it's a hot summer day and our hot fudge is also starting to melt because it's 92 degrees outside. Now we have to start to throw things in the incinerator for the glass cup to start to melt at about 1000 degrees and eventually our metal spoon will heat up and melt as well. And so these are all melting out of the sundae at different points in time. If we put together a rock sundae or an igneous rock sundae, the same thing will happen. The different components will melt out at different times. So say this 
Sunday is 5% olivine. Olivine will melt out at 1000 degrees Celsius. It's 15% pyroxene, which will melt out at 900 degrees Celsius. 40% quartz at 600 and 30% orthoclase at 650. So if I were to throw this in the incinerator and bring that up to 700 degrees Celsius, which minerals will melt and which ones will I be left with? So which ones will melt out or uh, fractionally melt out of our solid solution? Quartz will melt because uh, its melting point is below the temperature at which the incinerator is, as will the orthoclase, which leaves us with just olivine and pyroxene in our rock sundae. Here's an example of where we can actually see where this has happened in some bedrock. So we can see by the lighter coloration uh, in this striped rock that we have plagioclase. Mind you, those are lighter elemental compositions. And chromite, a heavier elemental composition. And plagioclase, those lighter elements will melt at a lower temperature than will the heavier elements of chromite, such as chromium which will melt at a higher temperature. So this is where they have melted out at different points and then solidified separately because they were separated by those different temperatures and different melting points. With that understanding, we can begin to categorize or subclassify our igneous rocks. Again, we have felsic, intermediate, and mafic. However, beyond that, we have extrusive and intrusive. Simply this means in or out, in or exit. Uh, extrusive being igneous rocks which formed above the surface from lava, and intrusive being igneous rocks which formed in the subsurface by magma. So we have two examples for each. So an extrusive mafic rock would be basalt, and an intrusive mafic rock would be gabbro. So continues for andesite, diorite, rhyolite, and granite. Again, as we move away from mafic rocks and towards felsic rocks, we are going to increase in those lighter elemental compositions, silica, sodium, potassium. And then as we move away from the felsic end of the spectrum towards the mafic end of the spectrum, we will be increasing in those heavier elements, magnesium, iron, and sometimes calcium. Now at first glance, this graph in the middle here may seem a little bit complicated, but if we split it up and break it down, really all this is telling us is what minerals and what percentages of those minerals will compose those rocks that we're looking at. So let's look at just the mafic side, so everything to the left of this line here. So we're considering basalt and gabbro, the extrusive and intrusive versions of each other. Either of those will have elemental compositions consisting of primarily pyroxene, a bit of olivine, and then this blue, which is plagioclase feldspar. So maybe 40% pyroxene, 40% plagioclase, 10% olivine, and perhaps somewhere around 10% of this brown, which is amphibole. So these colors just stretch over all of the categories because we're going to be getting different ranges of these minerals. And notice that we can go over here to the y-axis and look at exactly what those percentage ranges would be. So in this case, we're only going to find olivine within our mafic rocks. We're not going to find it in any intermediate or any felsic. And uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we're only going to find alkali feldspar within felsic or intermediate rocks not in mafic rocks because we don't see any pink within this chart there. If we take a look at this dashed line here as just an example, this would be one of our rarest combinations of intermediate rocks, an andesite or a diorite containing mica, amphibole, a even a tiny bit of pyroxene, a lot of plagioclase feldspar, a little bit of alkali feldspar, and a tiny bit of quartz as well, which covers all of our bases with the exception of olivine. Here's just another view of the same chart again. I'm showing you this not to overcomplicate it, but to let you know that there are different ways that we can represent this. So in this case, we've simply 
flipped our axes around. So we switched up the place of the x axis and the y axis, but it is communicating the exact same thing. With addition of density, relative density of all of these rocks with each other. So density is going to correspond with the weight of the elements within it. So we'll have our lower density here on the Felsic end of the spectrum and our higher density here at the mafic end of the spectrum. One more thing back on this diagram, you'll see that we have those same intrusive and extrusive categories, but instead of it being listed as uh, extrusive and intrusive, it is instead listed as finer grained and coarser grained. And this is because we can further classify our igneous rocks by the size, relative size of their grains, uh, those interlocking grain appearances. So in intrusive rocks, we will generally see an aphanitic texture, or excuse me, in intrusive rocks, we will see a phaneritic texture which means that we can see the boundaries of the individual grains. Even in this picture, we're not even looking at an actual sample. We can see the separation of exactly where this edge of this black grain ends and it comes in contact with the gray grains. If we were to able to look at this in person, we could probably see under our hand lens where maybe this pinkish gray meets the black and the gray or the, the white as well. So that would be a phanoritic texture where we can clearly see all of the grain boundaries with our naked eye or with the help of a hand, hand lens. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have a fine grain or aphanitic texture, and this is going to be the result of extrusive uh, igneous rocks or uh, lava solidification. So this would be lava solidification, and this would be magmatic solidification. And this is because simply the uh, intrusive bodies have longer periods of time at those higher temperatures and pressures to cool and crystallize. The more time that those molecules have to interact with other molecules and make bonds and form a structure, the, the larger the crystals we will have. If it cools relatively quickly, that's less time for those molecules to meet up and make those bonds, um, and we'll end up with smaller grains or smaller crystals. Further illustration of that idea, this is just corresponding the depth with the relative grain size. So at the greater depths, we'll have something more coarse grained where we can see those boundaries. At a lower depth, uh, we'll see something more fine grain or extrusive, we'll see something fine grain. And then if it cools very quickly, say a lava that erupts directly into the ocean, that's basically no time at all for those molecules to to make bonds and to form a structure, which is where we end up with glass, volcanic glass, which we call obsidian. And that's where those molecules are just frozen in time. There's no bonds at all. They're just suspended in solid space. Which brings us to the textures that we will talk about within igneous rocks, which are crystalline and clastic. Crystalline same idea as before, you can see all of those boundaries where they connect with each other. They are completely inter interlocking throughout the entire body. There's no space, there's no void. This is a, a petrographic view of this. So both of these two images here are uh, petrographic images, which means that we have taken a rock and very thinly sliced it down to the order of micrometers and put it on a Microscopes, microscope slide and are looking under it at it under a, a very fine lens of about anywhere from 100 at times to 250 times, sometimes 500 times the size, um, depending on what microscope you have. And we can manipulate that further with light. Uh, if we shine light in different directions, we'll see different properties of the minerals. And we'll get more into that as the semester continues, which is why we end up with all these fun shapes. This is not what you would see on the rock on the outside. This is probably a pyroxene-based rock, so mostly just a boring gray. But if we slice it up thinly and put it under different directions of light, we end up with this beautiful array of colors. And here we can see where all of these grains are meeting up. 
Now, you might think that that black empty space is empty space, but it's not empty space at all. It is just a mineral that has uh, a property by which when we sh shine light through it, it doesn't show up at all, which can sometimes be hard to distinguish between that and what would be an empty space, like the black or gray areas in this one. Mainly, what you're looking for to distinguish between those is A, changing the direction of the light that you're putting through the sample. If we change the direction, we might see it here. If we change the direction of the light here, we wouldn't see it at all. But also, what you can see right away is that these boundaries are not as well defined. Here it's a very clear, hard line, and here it's more of a fuzzy, almost a, a very thin gradient between the two. It's different from what's between these two and these two. And so this has empty space, and we would call that a clastic texture. So we can get crystalline, where those interlocking grains are right up next to each other in both intrusive and extrusive rocks. And then we can have clastic as well, which is just where there's any space in between these grains. That can be space that is just air, it's completely empty, or something that's been filled later on with sediment. And while those are the two main textures that we see, there are a few others that we can consider. Um, in intrusive rocks, we can have porphyritic texture, which is a result of that partial crystallization or fractional crystallization that we talked about before, where some things will crystallize out at lower temperatures and some will crystallize out at higher temperatures, which means that whatever is cooling at or what will crystallize out at the lower temperature will therefore have more time to grow and make those bonds and form uh, larger crystals, which ends up giving us this sort of chocolate chip cookie appearance, and we would call that a porphyritic texture. Again, we can have glassy anytime that it cools so quickly that we don't have any crystals that can form. So here's an example of that obsidian glass again. And here in all of these, we'll see this uh, sort of, con we call it conchoidal fracture where it has a, a sort of curved breakage to it. It can be very sharp, just like breaking uh, regular glass from your, your glass that you drink water out of or your window glass or anything like that. Pyroclastic describes uh, an aggregate or a collection of eruption debris. So those eruption debris can be rock fragments themselves, little pieces of rock, but also ash, uh, just straight burnt ash and they can be fused together uh, with the, just the residual heat from an eruption, which gives us a, a tough, would be an example of that, but we can get this sort of texture that looks almost like the porphyritic, where we have these chunks. But the main difference between these two is that these uh, will be two mainly different sizes, so a bimodal distribution, meaning we have a lot of medium grains and a lot of very fine grains. And here we have some very large grains, and some medium grains, and some small grains, and then some very fine grains. So there's a lot wider range in the pyroclastic texture than there is in the porphyritic texture. We can also have vesicular, which means that it contains many vesicles. Those vesicles are simply voids, and those are spaces where there once were gas bubbles, and they escaped from the magma as or lava as it was cooling and we still see those spaces solidified. So let's get a little bit of practice here together. We'll start with the example on the left here. Do you think that this has a phanerytic or aphonitic texture? Give me a couple seconds. That's exactly right, it is phanerytic texture and that's because we can see those interlocking grains. So would this be intrusive or extrusive? Did it come from magma or lava? Intrusive. Those crystals need, or those minerals and crystals needed time to be able to actually form uh, and expand to the size that they are. Looking at the example on the right, do we think that this is intrusive or extrusive? It's extrusive. Now what about pyroclastic or porphyritic? 
pyroclastic. Again, look at the range in grain size. We have some that are very large, some that are large, some that are medium, small, and then all of those against the very fine grain where you can't see the border at all. It just looks like a, a background brown orange matrix that all of these other colorful chunks are sitting in. So that would be the pyroclastic rather than the porphyritic. So that's all we have for part one. Um, we're going to pick right back up where we left off in part two, and we'll get more into volcanism, the different types of volcanoes, and the mechanisms by which they occur.